All right, uh, I think we can begin. So good evening, y'all, and uh, welcome to Equinox lecture, Understanding Stars Part 2. My name is Vikrant. I hope all of you can hear me. Can you just raise your hands if you can hear me? Yes. All right, awesome. Cool, uh, you can lower your hands now. So uh, my name is Vikrant, and I have been part of Nakshatra since April. Some of you might remember me from uh, the orientation date. So I'm also the cohort manager for Dark Matter A and uh, the team would kind of know me and we've had discussions and so on. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Mr. Alan Lobo. Uh, he's a very good friend of mine and also my teacher who taught me physics uh, for JAM and other competitive exams. He is a net JRF All India Rank 21 in 2016, and uh, that is one of his proudest achievements. He wouldn't probably agree to it, but yes. And uh, he's also a teacher at a coaching institute here in Bangalore called Gate IIT, where he teaches uh, physics for competitive exams, like starting from JE to NEET to JAM and NET and JEST and all the other competitive exams that you have. Uh, so. Alan, sir, I call him sir, but yeah, uh, welcome to Nakshatra's Equinox yeah. program. We're happy to have you here. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, let's start off so immediately. Start. Yeah, uh, yeah, we can start. So uh, guys, we'll have, if you have any questions, you can raise your hand in between and I will ask you to unmute yourself. Uh, we'll have a break after around 30 minutes or so. So it's around 8.10 right now. So we'll have a break at around 8.40ish, depending on if the topic is finished. And you guys can ask mm -hmm. your doubts either in the chat section or you can unmute yourself and ask. And we'll also have another formal Q&A session at the end of the lecture. Right. So Alan, sir, you can start off. All the best. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, can you all see the screen? Is the screen yeah. visible? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Okay, students. So uh, this lecture will be about uh, three topics altogether. I'm going to start with describing some uh, classical physics topics and how they form the foundation of astrophysics. In this, I'm going to talk about Newtonian mechanics and some aspects of gravitational motion. There's a motion under gravitational force. So how do planets and how the celestial objects move around them? And uh, during that course, I'm going to discuss a very important theorem called Virial Theorem with you all. Now, once that part is done, then I'm going to talk about some mathematical modeling of astrophysics, one of which is known as stellar evolution model. In that, I'm going to talk about some mathematical principles that tell us how a star is formed, the structure of a star, the evolution of a star and all that. And I'll conclude my lecture with uh, an example of such a model and a very small description about the birth of a star. So let's start. The first part here would be some Newtonian aspects and the origin of virial theorem. Now, when we talk about some natural forces that exist in this universe, Principally, we talk about the strong interaction, weak interaction, and uh, the electromagnetic and gravitational interaction. We can easily rule out the first two strong and weak nuclear forces because um, the events that we are going to talk about here is obviously going to be on a large scale and nuclear interaction occurs on a very small distance, all right, a very small distance. The distance effective for nuclear forces will be less than 10 to the power minus 15 meters so that those two forces get ruled out now when we talk about electromagnetic force actually we see the electromagnetic force and the gravitational force 
these two are the two dominating forces that we have in nature, at least at the celestial level. Now, electromagnetic forces can be ruled out because if let's say we have a system carrying equal negative and positive charges and neither of them having any relative motion with respect to the other, then the collective electromagnetic field that is produced by these two gets ruled out. It gets cancelled. You have equal positive and negative charges. And the reason why there must not be or there does not exist any relative motion between them is to also make sure that magnetic forces are ruled out as well. And that leaves us with only gravitational force. So one simple conclusion that we can come to from here is that the most dominating force that we have in nature as far as the celestial level is considered is the gravitational force. Now, when we talk about the dynamics of motion under gravitational forces, a very simple equation of motion can help us understand how objects actually move in this force. Now, looking at the simple equation F, which is nothing but mass times the double derivative of position vector r cap. Now, this should be equal to gmm over r square r cap. Now, this equation is nothing but the differential equation of a body under the influence of the gravitational force. Now, for this, we will assume that m is much, much bigger than small m. All right. Now, we, of course, we are going to talk, for example, the sun and one small planet or an asteroid or a comet moving under the influence of the sun. All right. Now, when we discuss this part, we start solving this in a very simple elementary way. m times, now if I write this as dv by dt, the time derivative of velocity, this would become equal to minus gmm over r square r cap. Now, a simple substitution from planar motion, r cap, the unit vector along the position vector, which I'll just draw here and show. This is your x and y axis, let's assume. And let's say this is the position vector of the body with the center of the force capital M present on the origin. All right, and this is the small body here. So the direction vector here, this is R cap, where this is the position vector itself. This is your x axis and this is your y axis. And this here, is the angular position theta. Now, we can prove very easily that R cap is nothing but minus theta cap dot divided by theta dot. What does a dot mean? Dot generally means a time derivative. All right, so if I write theta dot, it is d theta by dt. If I write R dot, it is nothing but dr by dt time derivative. Okay, now we can solve this quite easily. And to, uh, to go to the next step, we talk about some basics of motion under this case. We see that energy, angular momentum, and the plane of motion These three are constants when the body moves under the influence of a central force such as gravity. Now, coming back here, if I substitute for the angular momentum L, which is m r square theta, we can show that L by gmm times dv by dt is equal to 
सीधा चाप तक और राइट यूजिंग दिस सब्सिट्यूशन यूर आई पुट एल एज एम आर स्क्वायर की डाटा All right, so R cap here, which is then become equal to this is minus theta cap dot times theta dot. So substituting this R square theta dot by L by M, R square theta dot is equal to L by M. Putting that value here, we get this equation. Now let's keep this constant as constant A. I told you angular momentum is a constant. G is the universal gravitational constant. For those of you who don't know, capital M, small m, both are constants. Now, integrating this equation with time, we can see that a times v is theta cap plus the constant of integration c, which again can be determined using initial condition. So, at some time t equals to zero. All right, let's talk about the um, initiation of this motion. At t equals to zero, we can just put theta cap, which is nothing but the tangential direction. Here you can see r cap in this way. So what would be theta cap? Theta cap is nothing but the tangential direction of motion. Here. This is theta cap. Here. All right. So putting theta cap as some original initial value, n cap. We come to the result. That a times v is equal to theta cap plus e n cap, where e currently is a dimensionless constant. All right. Now, finding the dot product of this result with theta cap. We arrive at the general equation of motion. A times r square theta dot divided by r is equal to one plus e cos theta. Now, to get this solution, I have substituted v, the velocity vector, as a sum of the radial velocity for a body moving radially and tangential velocity for a body moving tangentially. So the radial velocity is nothing but dr by dt, of course, along r cap, and the tangential direction is r d theta by dt theta cap. So basically, it's r dot r cap plus r theta dot theta cap. Now, taking this value again using the constant r square theta dot as l by m. As was substituted before, we arrive to a result l square by g m m square times one by r. Now, what I have done here is I've put the value of a. You remember, a was nothing but l by g m. So l square by g m m square times one by r is equal to one plus e cos theta, and we take this constant. We give it another term. Let's call it p. You can give it any other term. Also, does not matter. You get p by r as one plus e cos theta. So ultimately, the equation of motion turns out to be r is equal to p divided by one plus e cos theta. Now, p is a constant here. This equation of motion is in the polar form. Polar form, polar coordinate system. In the Cartesian coordinate system, this equation gets reduced further, putting r as the root of x square plus y square, and cos theta as x divided by root of x square plus y square, as evident from this diagram. This is r, which is nothing but some x plus some y. As such, so y turns out to be plus minus of p square plus e square minus one times x square 
minus 2 e p x the whole power 1 by 2. Now this equation seems to be a little complicated but when you try to draw the graph of this curve you realize something very interesting. This as a matter of fact is the same example uh, same equation that was used by Kepler to understand how celestial bodies move under the influence of a star's gravitational interaction. The value of E, which was a dimensionless constant, has just been replaced with the constant A here in this equation that you can see. Can you see this graph here, students? Vikrant, is it visible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. So when you look at this graph, all I have done is I have squared the equation that I wrote before. Y was equal to a square root. And I've kept P as a constant 2. If you take the value of E, which I've written as A here, as 0 0.4, you can see the path is an ellipse. By changing the value of E as 1, we see the path eventually becomes a parabola. Here is 1. Now, if I increase the value of E to beyond 1, the path becomes a hyperbolic path. Now, what does this tell us? Take a look here. When we talk about this equation, the value of E, which was initially assumed to be a dimensionless constant, which sounds very insignificant, right now seems to describe the entire dynamics of motion of a planet. Not just planet, it can we, we can talk about uh, comet also, asteroid, any celestial object for that matter. We can also talk about the motion of a star in a galaxy. All of that can be understood from this equation. Now, how do we determine the value of E? Simple calculations can also show that E, which is now called eccentricity, which some of you might be familiar with from the mathematical topic conic section, is equal to 1 plus 2mp square times the energy of the body divided by its angular momentum L square. Now this value is very important. Notice that and I'll carry this forward. So we see eccentricity is equal to 1 plus 2 mp square e upon L square. Here p was nothing but a constant L square by G M M square. E is the total mechanical energy of the body. M is the mass of the body and everything else is also a constant. Now, some different values will help you understand how objects move. The mechanical energy that we are talking about here is nothing but the total energy of the body, which is the sum of its kinetic energy plus its potential energy. Now, kinetic energy can be written as half mv square. Potential energy, however, is a negative term. It's minus gmm upon r. This is something important that you should be aware of. For any attractive interaction, the potential energy is always negative in nature. Whereas for a repulsive interaction, potential energy is always positive in nature. All right. Uh, once again, at the end of the course, we will be using this concept to understand the dynamics of motion. We'll come to that later. Now, let's see certain scenarios. Let's talk about the case in which the body is very small. All right, case one, the body is very small, but very fast. 
all right the body is very small but at the same time very fast so the body being small describes that the potential energy is less and the body being very fast it describes the kinetic energy to be very high this collectively tells you that the value of energy would be more likely to be positive and if this is true then in that case the eccentricity of the motion since capital e is positive the value of eccentricity will also definitely be 1 plus something positive which would be e more than 1 and when you look at the graph for this case you see that the path is a hyperbolic path hyperbolic path now a hyperbolic path is just a path in which the object would approach the sun and would go away and never return back it's an unbounded motion unbounded motion means the object comes close to the center of force and then goes away and never comes back very small and high energy comets take this path they are small and they are very fast because of which they come once and then they go something similar happens when both of them become equal this is case 2 when potential energy is equal to kinetic energy this condition occurs when the body is relatively bigger but still fast when it is bigger but still fast what would happen is that the potential energy and the kinetic energy both will match each other because of which the resultant energy would become zero this equals this so the result is zero now when the total mechanical energy is zero eccentricity has no choice but to become equal to 1 which results in a parabolic path which is something quite similar to a hyperbolic path all right which is also an unbounded motion the body will come close to the star or the sun in this case but would never come back again all right a hyper a parabolic path would be something like this the third case is the case of big but small big but uh, what is it called slow objects big but slow objects now you can think of a conclusion here right away big would imply that the potential energy is very big very high but the kinetic energy is very less because of which the mechanical energy can be less than zero such a condition is a closed condition and this is important please remember that when the motion has to be unbound sorry the when the motion has to be bound motion when the motion has to be bound bound meaning the motion of the body is stuck between two points it cannot cross its boundary then its energy has to be less than zero this is important later on when we understand how a star is formed which will come to in around 15 20 minutes we'll have to impose this condition that the mechanical energy of the system must be less than zero only then a system gets stuck to where it is driven it gets bounded to its position and in such a case you can see the motion becomes elliptical all right which is what the uh, what happens to planets all the planets they are big but they are relatively much slower as compared to comets and other fast moving objects because of which their motion gets bounded and they are stuck in an orbit now since they are stuck in this orbit they cannot move away from their orbits and they keep moving in the same path forever all right so what you have understood from here is that the motion of objects which was initially thought to be a function of the force acting on the body which was the gravitational force as i showed you here using the simple case of equation of motion this equation of motion here ultimately tells us that the entire 
drama of all of this is based completely on the energy of the particle. You can see how the equation of motion describes a very important term which we call eccentricity that describes the path of the objects and the eccentricity itself is in turn based on the total mechanical energy of the object. So it is nothing but the energy that describes how the particle or the body, whatever be its size, whether it is a small dust particle or whether it's something as big as a big planet, even a star or something. The behavior of all such particles is understood and describable by understanding it as its energy. So let's talk about this energy concept a little bit more. For the case of simplicity, we'll talk about a simple circular path. And let's assume that the center of force is present right at the center. All right. Now for the body to have, a, as you can see, if the body is moving, this is let's say capital M, the source of the central force, in this case, gravitational force. And the body that is moving under this force has a mass of small m. Now, as I told you before, since the motion is bounded, it forever keeps moving in the same orbit. And therefore, its gravitational force, which is minus gmm by r square, must be balanced by the centrifugal force acting on it, which is mv square by r. Right? Otherwise, if the gravitational force is much more, what will happen is that the body will be pulled inside. So eventually, the body will just spiral inside the center. If the centrifugal force, hypothetically speaking, if the centrifugal force is more than the gravitational force. Now, in reality, it is not possible. But let's just assume, okay, for the sake of ruling this out, let's assume that the centrifugal force turns out to be more than the gravitational force, then what would happen? The body will just be pushed away, it will be thrown away from the object. So to balance both of these conditions, to cancel both of these conditions, we assume that this equation is held true. And if this equation is true, then cancelling some simple variables, we see that mv square is equal to minus g m m by r. And this is simple algebra, but this is something very surprising as well. We know that kinetic energy is half m v square, right? Yes. So m v square here is nothing but twice of the kinetic energy of the body. And twice of the kinetic energy is turning out to be, what is this? This is nothing but the potential energy. We come across a very interesting result. Now, what is this result? This is known as the Virial theorem. This is what we call Virial theorem. Got it? All right. So, so, so I'm assuming the virial theorem uh, part is done. No, 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 no. I'm. No. Uh, I'll continue I mean, this for some more time. For a uh, break uh, is what I wanted. No, no, no. Uh, not right now. I we have some more time talks to finish. I'll come to the break in some time. Give me five and ten more minutes. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay. Anyways, so. We came to a simple result called Virial Theorem. Now, what is this Virial Theorem? This theorem is going to describe to us a lot of important concepts about the formation of a star. All right. When we talk about So when we talk about some applications of video theorem, 
which can have a simple statement, all right? We saw that choice of the kinetic energy must be equal to the potential energy of the body. And I can still generalize it. I can say that the gravitational potential energy of the body and the kinetic energy of the body should be of the same order, must be of the same order in order to stop the gravitational force to crush the, the planet or pull the planet towards the central force. Or in other words, for a stable motion under the influence of gravitation, the kinetic energy and the potential energy of the body must be of the same order. This is the order. Anyways. So let's come back. We can use the Virial theorem for a number of interesting concepts. You can also use Virial theorem to talk about the energy of a star or the temperature of a star. Just to demonstrate, if let's say we talk about the gravitational potential energy at the surface of a star, so that would just be g m square by r, the minus sign of course. So minus, uh, this is the potential energy of the surface of the star. Now, we know that the star is nothing but a very condensed packet of hot gases. So if I talk about the internal energy in such a case, U, which is nothing but the total kinetic energy of the system, is N times kVT. Well, what is N? N is nothing but the total number of particles. Now, this can be written as the total mass of the star divided by mass of each hydrogen atom. All right, divided by kVT. So if I equate these two according to Virial theorem, I know that the kinetic energy and the potential energy must be of the same order. So m by mh kBT must be equal to having the same form. I'll keep it in mod gm square by r, right? Almost equal at least, having the same order. Now solving this. If we talk about the sun itself, so we'll just keep the mass as 10 power 30 kg and the value of radius as 10 power 7 meters. All right, the Boltzmann constant Kb approximately equal to 10 power 23, minus 23 joule per Kelvin and the mass of hydrogen atom as 10 power minus 27 kg. Now, when you keep all of these together, the temperature of the star in this case turns out to come across 10 power 7 Kelvin. Now, experimentally, the result that we get is 1.5 times 10 to the power 7 Kelvin. As you can see, it's very close. Got it. So this is just one very simple application of this Virial theorem. So what are its limitations? Now, see, one thing is very clear. During all these calculations, we have been dealing with values and sizes to be very large, very large values and very big masses and stuff like that. Now, when we talk about Newtonian mechanics on the daily scale and daily level, we don't normally deal with such conditions, right? So what is the limit of these concepts? What is the condition where we'll have to stop using all these concepts? And when do we apply general theory of relativity? Now, if I talk about a simple application of trapping a photon, with gravitation. Let's talk, let's talk about this possibility. What if we can trap light also using gravitation, like we actually see happening in uh, black holes and stuff. One thing is for sure that even if we don't assume that Newton 
was right in every such condition, we have to congratulate him. And as a matter of fact, we should worship him for his marvelously close approximations. Now, if we talk about this condition, the light moves, or let's assume that there is an object of mass m and speed equal to the speed of light, which is c. And use a very non relativistic condition, half mc squared is the kinetic energy. Now, this condition would simply produce that the energy of the particle would be half mc squared minus gmm by r when it moves under the influence of gravity. Now, solving this and assuming, I told you that since the light must be trapped, since the photon must be trapped, it must have a bound state energy. So energy must be less than zero. So putting this value half mc square minus gmm by r less than zero, this will just give us a simple result that half mc square must be less than gmm by r which can be written further as 2gm by c square r must be more than 1. Now this is something important. Newtonian physics does not account for this trapping. All right. So as far as this factor that you see here, 2gm by c square r is much, much lesser than 1. We'll call this factor f. All right. If this factor is much lesser than 1, then we can very easily use Newtonian mechanics to solve the problems. But as this factor approaches the value 1, we have to shift to a more subtle form of physics, which is called general relativity. You can also use a simple approximation. You can keep mass as den uh, density times estimated volume, 4 by 3 pi r cube. Keeping this value, you would get f to be equal to 8 pi by 3 times g rho by c square times r square. Right, and this value must tend to one for using general relativity. If this value is very small, then we don't need to use it at all. So you might ask, what is the value of this small r? What is the value of radius or the size of the system for us to use the general theory of relativity? Or as a better question, do we do we have a system in which we have to use general relativity? The answer is yes. If we take the sample space as this universe itself, the big enormous universe, then the value of R is large enough for us to start using general relativity. And the study of such a system, such a big system, is known as cosmology. This is what cosmology is. Got it? So this ends the talk on the understanding of radial theorem and uh, the basics of gravitation. Now we can discuss if there are any questions. All right. Uh, so we can take a small break. And uh, those who have questions, you guys can raise your hands. Uh, we'll take only two questions right now, and we'll continue the talk. All right, so uh, Dwij, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. You raised your hand. Okay, so um, in the eccentricity formula, yeah, there was an expression under root of one plus something. Yes, one plus two mp square e by l square. Yes, so yeah. in that, the what if the energy is so low that the square mm -hmm. root term becomes negative? Okay. And we got we get into the complex. Imaginary. Section. Yes. Yeah. We don't get complex, we get imaginary. 
now see mathematically eccentricity cannot be negative so if i uh, it can be imaginary it cannot be imaginary so if i just show you a simple result here when e can you see the screen here was equal to 1 plus 2 mp square e by l square now from this result we have to make sure that eccentricity is only purely real so for which the energy has the least value the energy can be more than or at least equal to minus l square by 2 mp square it cannot be lower than this got it and if you put this value you will see the eccentricity becomes zero which results in a circular path so the so question is what will happen yeah so is there a possibility like if it happens what is heck going to happen graphically you know uh, yeah if it happens going to happen in real uh, life understood. if it happens in reality let's say the energy of the body is too low then the eccentricity or the path of a body does not get defined and the body simply starts falling towards the center and eventually comes to the center Did you understand? In such a case, there is no stable structure. Got it? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Dwij. Uh, Vishal, you can unmute yourself and ask your question, and then we'll continue yeah. with the talk. Okay. So the eccentricity and the energy stuff yeah. uh, can this be applied to the atom level? Ah, thing? see, this is another very interesting application. classical physics and this is not actually classical physics this is mathematical physics all right you can apply this in every valid situation considering two things the first thing is that you need to make sure that there are no external perturbations acting external perturbation means external influences for example you are talking about the atomic level right in the atomic yeah. level what force do you think is acting on the system the electrostatic force of interaction between the nucleus and the electron agree yes. but you are forgetting something you are forgetting that both of these particles the nucleus and the electron are spinning at their own position so there is also a magnetic interaction right yes. we also have to take into account that these two particles are not actually particles these two waves. are waves yes i won't say waves wave like structure so we have to include the, that property as well into this are to complicate it yes so it does not become complicated it just becomes a problem of quantum mechanics rather than classical mechanics got it so the uh, ingredients are same but they are more stuff yes like ingredients it. are always same and that's just the first thing the second part is to make sure that our concepts are not the relativistic in nature see these laws of physics remain same for every object uh, but they get modified when objects start moving at high speed uh, so if you keep these two concepts in your mind then you can use these models for any system it would not matter yeah uh, you can solve a question of projectile motion as well using these concepts it will still give you the correct result got okay. it so Okay. Uh, so let's move on, uh, Alan sir. We can continue with the talk. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So can you see the screen? Is the screen visible? Yes. Yes, sir. Go on. Okay. The next topic that I'm going to talk about is stellar evolution models. stellar evolution models now what is a stellar evolution model now a stellar evolution model is not actually a model per se it is a mathematical equation like i told before it's a mathematical model that describes the life cycle of a star got it now of course to create such a mathematical equation you require a lot of factors a lot of data you have to interpret that data you have to make some very interesting 
although little complex calculation. And once you solve it, just like we did before in all of these equations, what we did is we did, we took this data that the force acting is actually the gravitational force and we finalized on a result. So such a model to describe the life cycle of a star is called a stellar revolution model. Now, let's talk about how we create this model and some factors associated with all this. And then I'll just describe one simple model to you all so that you can understand how uh, theoretical astrophysicists actually work. All right. Okay. Now, when we talk about a star, we cannot actually go into the star and understand the uh, you know, formation and evolution of the star, right? That is impractical. So the only tool that we have is a theoretical approach, right? Now, think about it. If we have a theoretical approach towards things, we naturally always start with a general set of assumptions. All right, now these assumptions are not wrong and they do not uh, give us a very inaccurate result either. That's not true. What we do is we first take a set of assumptions, simple assumptions, which cannot be denied as a matter of fact. And using these assumptions, we create a result. And then what we do, like I discussed uh, a few seconds ago, we introduce some perturbations, perturbations meaning some modifications in our concepts. We introduce some new factors. For example, let's say the star is actually spinning in nature. Let's say there is some magnetic interaction of the star with a nearby star, something like that. So we start introducing certain factors and thereby we start canceling these assumptions. And that gives us a final result. And then this final result is you know, verified using experiments. And if it comes out to be true, we have a Nobel Prize in front of us, but if, turns, if it turns out to be wrong, then we start again from here. We see what was wrong and we try to modify it. So that's the process in which astrophysics actually works. And every form of sciences works actually uh, based on this. Anyways, coming to the topic. So what are the assumptions that we normally make? We first assume that the star is spherically symmetric. Star is spherically symmetric. Second, we assume that the star is in dynamic equilibrium. Now, what is meant by dynamic equilibrium? It means that, let me just write it, star is in dynamic equilibrium. Now, what this means is that the net energy radiated by a star is actually equal to the net energy produced by it. All right, how it produces is a topic that will come to a little later. The third topic or the third assumption actually is that the star is in steady state. Now, which steady state? Thermal steady state. Thermal steady state. So thermal steady state means what? It means that if you take any point in that star, then the temperature at that point inside the star remains constant. It does not change with time. Got it? Now, it does not mean that the temperature at every point is equal. That's not what I said. I said at a certain point, the temperature is to, to be constant. All right? So these are three assumptions. Now, these three are actually verifiable assumptions and they're not something very complicated or uh, uh, very extreme to assume. And using these, we can understand some important factors that are necessary for us to create such a mathematical model. Now, the first factor necessary for all this is the idea of hydrostatic equilibrium. Idea of a hydrostatic equilibrium. Now, a hydrostatic equilibrium is not, again, it's not a topic of uh, astrophysics per se. It's actually a topic of 
thermodynamics you can say all right what is hydrostatic equilibrium now we can actually observe experimentally that the luminosity of stars do not change with time very rapidly meaning they can be said to be a constant at least they don't change very rapidly they change very slowly so it is therefore very easy to assume that the size of the star is also constant for a significant amount of time or at least it's changing very slowly therefore it must mean that at any given point the net inward force that is the net force that is trying to compress a star is equal to the net outward force all right that's what will make the size of the star a constant because the star does not remain static don't think of a star as an object a star is actually a very huge system a very huge thermonuclear system in which changes keep occurring all right so it's a huge chemistry lab for all of us right it keeps a lot of things keep happening inside so uh, let's assume a simple structure of the star this is your x and y axis and here we we'll we are going to take some random radius now the total radius of the star is capital r but we are going to take a small radius here as much smaller radius small r let's say okay and let's talk about a small volume right on top of this smaller sphere now this volume is db let's say all right now this is at a small distance r r here this is much smaller than r okay now the mass of this small element mass of dv is equal to rho density which is a function of r itself times dv here it is initially understood that the density of the star changes as the its radius changes now a will be nothing but the area this area here this area of the dv element area of the dv element of volume which is perpendicular to the radius all right so it's basically perpendicular to the surface all right now the gravitational force pulling this element dv towards the center is going to be minus g mass of this sphere smaller sphere m of small r divided by r square times rho r dv rho r dv is nothing but the mass of the element all right now for equilibrium this force must be equal to the force exerted by the thermal pressure outside that is minus g m r rho r dv divided by r square should be equal to pressure times area now what is area area is nothing but volume divided by radius so this would become p times dv by dr all right so cancelling dv dv i'll get in a differential form you get minus g m r rho r by r square is equal to dp by dr all right and this itself is called the equation of hydrostatic equilibrium 
very important equation please copy this down equation of hydrostatic equilibrium this is the reason why a star does not collapse actually you can also understand the same conclusion using virial theorem again a star would not collapse if the structure is stable and to make the structure stable the kinetic energy of the particles moving under the influence of this um, thermal energy inside the sun or inside the star if they are of the same order as the gravitational potential energy then the structure will become stable and the star will not collapse so anyways this is the equation of hydrostatic equilibrium now here i have also used one another important result m r which was nothing but the mass of the sphere of radius small r would be nothing but integration of rho r times 4 pi r square dr this here is nothing but dv elementary volume this one. all right now using this equation i can create another result dm of r by dr is equal to rho r times 4 pi r square this is another equation very important equation called the mass continuity equation also important got it now something interesting that i'll show you here if i use this equation once again let me just write it once again we have minus g m of r times rho of r by r square as dp upon dr dp upon dr multiplying this equation with 4 pi r cube dr on both the sides all right let's do we get dp by dr times 4 pi r cube dr should be equal to minus g m r rho r 4 pi r cube divided by r square dr and if i integrate it if i integrate both the sides let's let's understand let's try to see what the result is all right so solving the lhs first right hand side first uh, using um, what's it called integration by parts here it's not something complicated i can take this as u and i can take this as v and my result would turn out to be p actually i'll take this as v here i'll take this as u and make things easy so uh, integration of v will become dp by dr integration with dp so this becomes p times 4 pi r q now of course the limits of integration will be from 0 to r so this result from 0 to r minus now the second part integration this would become integration of 3 times 4 pi r square times p with dr again from 0 to r this is going to be equal to the rhs now we'll come to rhs later this value turns out to be 0 at r equals to 0 you put the value and anyways it becomes 0 at r equals to capital r the pressure itself is 0 right at the surface the pressure itself will be 0 isn't it so because there is no other mass that is trying to push it down so this term eventually becomes 0 and what is this let's talk about the situation here now the internal energy of a system using thermodynamics u is nothing but 3 by 2 p times dv which is 3 by 2 times p times 4 pi r square dr right so 2u would become equal to what 2 times 3 by 2 times p times 4 pi r, p r square dr which would be 3 p 4 pi r square dr this is 2 take a look here it's the same thing so the rhs 
is nothing but to you. So the LHS is nothing but to you. Now, what is RHS? Let's come to uh, RHS now. This thing here. Now, if we talk about the average density row, all right, keeping this as m at r divided by 4 by 3 pi r cube and putting this value in this equation, we come to see that this integration is nothing but 3 by 5 gm by r gm squared by r. This is not something very complicated. gm r. From 0 to r, this becomes capital R, which becomes the total mass. So basically, this is nothing but the total potential energy of the system, which again gives you the same result, that twice of the internal energy must be equal to potential energy. What is this? This is again the video here. So virial theorem again turns out to be a very important part of the stellar evolution model. Very important equation. All right, going to the next topic. Now we're going to see some sources of stellar energy. So what are these sources that we talk about? Now, if I assume that the only source of energy that the star has is its own potential energy, then it would imply, it would simply imply that the total energy that was spent in the evolution of a star, in the creation of a star, would be equal to 3 by 5 gm square by r, as seen by the last result here. Now, if I use this energy to calculate the total time for which a star will exist, the lifetime of a star, how will I do that? I'll use the, I'll use the method of luminosity. I'll see how much energy is being radiated by the star per unit time. And uh, I would calculate the total time required to spend or radiate this much energy. And if I talk about the sun, once again, as an example, the life, you know, lifespan of the sun that I would get as a result would be approximately 10 to the power 7 years. Now, evidence will suggest something very different. We know that the present age of the sun is already 10 power 9 years, right? Something close to 10 power 9 years. So, that means that the concept of the potential energy being the only source of the energy in a star is ruled out. So there must be some other energy concept as well. So what is that? One very simple answer to this problem is nuclear energy. So what type of nuclear energy are we talking about? If we talk about nuclear fission, then in nuclear fission, we see large nuclei, very large nuclei, breaking down into smaller ones. All right, and releasing a lot of energy. Uh, I think all of you are familiar with what fission is. But the problem is that we don't find such elements inside the star. All right, so there is no evidence to support fission. And hence, we come to the next one, which is fusion. Now, nuclear fusion is supported by a lot of evidence. And uh, one of the key equations that occur inside the star would be a set of fusion chain, for example, a PP chain. Now, what is a PP chain? Proton, proton, click it. Yes, Vivek, are you saying something? Okay. So what is a PP chain? A PP chain is a three-step process 
in which a lot of energy is released. I'll just show it to you. So we have one proton fusing with another proton, giving me H2 isotope plus 1E plus, what is this, a positron, plus one neutrino. Now this would release 1.19 mega electron volt. 1.19 mega electron volt. Now, another proton, the step two, will interact with this deuterium and will create an isotope of helium, He3, plus a photon, gamma particle. Now, this will release 5.49 mega electron volts. Then, two of such helium isotopes will again fuse to create He4 plus H1 plus H1. This will again release something close to 12.8 mega electron volts. So see what is happening here. All right. And this process goes on. You can see in this chain, a lot of energy is released. All right, now there is a similar chain called uh, CNO cycle, carbon nitrogen oxygen cycle, uh, which also releases a lot of energy, but that process will not occur in stars which do not have carbon in the first place. So um, we are not going to talk about that. So anyway, so that's your concept. Now using this, I can create another equation. I can show to you that this energy released will obviously depend on the amount of fuel present inside the star. Hence, the luminosity dl would be directly proportional to the element mass element dm. So keeping a constant here, dl, I can write as some epsilon times dm. And putting dm as rho times 4 pi r square, I get another equation which is actually a basic equation of stellar structure. So DL, where L stands for luminosity, becomes epsilon times rho r times 4 pi r square. This is another equation. So here I've shown to you some important results that are used to produce a stellar evolution model. And you can also go through some more simpler equations. The radiative energy transport equation radiative energy transport equation which is basically dt upon dr is equal to minus 3 by 4 a c multiplied with k luminosity times rho r divided by temperature q times 4 pi r square. All right. Then conductive energy transport equation. Conductive energy transport equation, which is also something similar. dt by dr is equal to minus 1 minus 1 by gamma. I, I think some of you know what gamma is here times mu m by again kb times g m upon r squared. m is a function of r. So these are some uh, more results that uh, some more equations that we can use to create a stellar model. And using all these models, we create a structure, mathematical structure of a star. One of the examples for this is a polytropic stellar model. The polytropic stellar model. Now, what is this polytropic stellar model? Now, this structure is based on the simple idea that when any change occurs in the equilibrium structure of the star, its specific heat C, which is nothing but dq by d. All right, dq by dt. 
remains a constant. Such a process in which both pressure and uh, volume are changing is known as a polytropic process. All right. Now, this structure is given by the equation known as lean Emden equation, which is not something very difficult to formulate from the data that I've given to you. Here, I'm going to use some uh, variables. So I just described the uh, legend first. Here, epsilon, I'll use as R by alpha. Now, what is alpha here? Alpha is n plus one times k divided by four pi g times the density of the core to the power one by n minus one. The entire thing to the power one by two. N here is the polytropic index. If you studied thermodynamics, you will know what it is. And uh, if you are not aware of this, one by gamma minus one, where gamma is the adiabatic cost in you know, a gas constant. All right. Theta is not the angle here. Theta is a function called the lane Emden function. All right, the lean Emden function, which would be equal to, uh, it's actually an expansion. So one minus epsilon squared by six plus N by 120 epsilon power four. It will just, you know, just continue as such. All right, you can just go through these in your own uh, free time. Sorry for the background noise there. Anyway. So what is the equation that we talk about the lane Emden function? The lane Emden um, equation that is. The equation is one by epsilon square d by d epsilon of epsilon square d theta by d epsilon is equal to minus theta to the power n. Now if you're a student of mathematical physics, you will know that this is something coming out of the Laplace equation, which is not something complicated to understand. And what does this tell you? It provides a simple graph between the relative density of the given point divided by the core density, rho C, divided by a simple ratio, radius, you know, distance from the center divided by the total radius of the star. The graph that you get from here is something as such. It would be something like this. Now it depends on the value of n. This can be for n equals to three, let's say. And if let's say this would be for n equals to 1.5. All right. Now, uh, result of this equation would be something as such let me show it to you uh, this would be the result of such a structure can you see this structure all of you Yes. Yeah. But as you can see, the density varies. All right, you have the core radiative zone, the convective zone, like that. Is this understood? Now, Now, finishing all this is, we have talked about the mathematical aspect of all of this. And if we just talk about how a star is actually formed, we see that 
it all starts from something called the interstellar medium ism which consists of a lot of things the 15 15 to 20% of our milky way galaxy itself is made of dust particles gases molecules atoms and ions and all that so roughly the interstellar medium which i have abbreviated as ism interstellar medium can be divided into an h2 region h1 region then intercloud medium intercloud medium and then molecular clouds so what is h2 region h2 region is actually as the name suggests it is consisting of hydrogen ions all right hydrogen ions now understand and remember that it is very difficult to ionize a hydrogen atom all right because of its high ionization energy so because of this the h plus ions will require high temperatures so that is why h2 region is present only near the vicinity of very hot stars all right very hot stars having the temperature of around let's say 25000 kelvin all right the surface temperature that is but right. so how do they produce this emission spectrum they do not produce their own spectrum they absorb the high energy photon from these hot stars and hence produce the spectra that we can observe on the other hand the h1 region consists of hydrogen atoms all right this consists of neutral h atoms not uh, now what happens here is that h atoms have low energy got it they actually have very low temperature also from 30 to let's say 80 kelvin and their masses are also from 1 to some 100 solar masses 1 to some 100 solar masses the third region the intercloud medium consists of two things principally the first is neutral h atoms having a relative density density of let's say 10 to the power 5 atoms per meter cube and high energy ionized particles ion ions you can say directly so high energy ions having temperatures of something close to 8000 kelvin and density of 10 to the power 4 ions per meter cube all right then the molecular clouds which are also called giant molecular clouds gmc actually seem to carry these molecules hydrogen molecules even carbon monoxide molecules now, how are these molecules formed? One theory is that these atoms come in very close proximity with each other and thus produce some covalent bonding and all. All right, they have very less, ener less energy, less temperature, something close to 10 Kelvin and all. So, this is actually what exists in the interstellar gas. All right, and then you have some interstellar dust also. Interstellar dust. Now, this dust particles are actually uh, crystals of silicates and graphite covered by ice. All right, 
silicates and graphite stored by I. So that's your structure. So basically what happens is because of their own masses, they start getting compressed. They start attracting themselves and they start contracting. Now, as they contract the, just a minute, I'll show to you the process here. So as you can see, as the interstellar cloud contracts, the contraction causes the mass to concentrate more and more. Now, there is a condition that governs all of this. If the mass is more than a certain value called John mass, then after this collapsing, the structure becomes more stable and starts to, you know, break into fragments as you can see here the structure starts to break into fragments now each fragment later attains a condition where it reaches again the hydrostatic equilibrium and is now called a protostar then a protostar develops into a uh, you know pre uh, you can say uh, the, the earlier versions of a star and after that is done you, you you know using your nuclear reactions nucleosynthesis starts from there and the pre main sequence star starts to develop which eventually leads to the formation of a star so this is how the entire evolution of a star begins and then continues as you have studied in the last class using hr diagrams and all so this is your talk on the evolution of stars and the stellar evolution model. Got it? All right. Awesome. So uh, we will end the talk here. Yeah, yeah, it's done for me. <laughs> I think it was amazing and you told us very well as to what a theoretical astrophysicist does, how mathematical physics applies almost to everything, starting from stars all the way down to atoms with a little tweaking here and there. Uh, we're now open to questions. So uh, all of you who have questions, you can just raise your hand and I will ask you to unmute yourself one by one. And Alan, sir, would answer I'll, your question. I'll stop my video um, sometimes because my network connection is becoming unstable. So if sure, there sir. is any unstable notification showing that I have to stop it. Yeah, just continue. Yeah, sure. No problem. So uh, we're open to questions. You guys can raise your hands if you want to ask something. And I will ask you to unmute yourself. Any questions so far? You're surprising. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, let's check the chat. Nothing. OK. <coughs> There's nothing in the chat. Uh, no, I don't think there's any questions in the chat as well. Right. So, okay, that means it was very good that either everyone uh, understood. Can, can I ask? Uh, hello? Yeah, yes, yes, sir. Sure, sure, sure. Go ahead. Please go uh, ahead. How is this uh, atom energy related to interstellar uh, uh, energy, the Jonasons you just mentioned? Please uh, repeat. I could not understand what you're asking. You just mentioned the donation of interstellar medium and the, uh -huh. uh, yes correct so so how is the vacuum energy related to this see when we talk about the energy or the temperature i think you are referring to when i was telling you about what is the temperature of a specific part of the interstellar medium what is the specific temperature of uh, let's say h2 region or h1 region so we First, there are two things actually. First, we detect these energies based on uh, radio, uh, radiology methods. We try to observe the energy radiated by a star. If you just uh, look at a simple diagram of how a radio telescope looks at a stellar system, you will realize that there are different signatures of energies produced. 
Now, let's say you are observing a given scenario, all right? So your job is, first most, your job is to observe the different regions of energy. And then it is your job to explain how these readings are possible. So for example, let's say you have the stellar system, the star itself at the center, all right? The temperature of the star is a different topic. You can, uh, as I've already showed you using many methods, even using video theorem, you can describe the temperature of the star and stuff like that. So once that is understood, then you look at the region surrounding it, right? Now, the size of a star can be measured by every, you know, a very different method, all right, using parfaits and all, it's not something difficult. So what about this energy that is surrounding it? What about this radiation that is coming from much far away from the surface of the star? You have to account for this, right? Now, when you compare these readings with laboratory readings of the hydrogen atom spectrum or the hydrogen ion spectrum, you realize that these readings match. So that's how you come to the conclusion that yes, you have uh, uh, so-and-so material, so-and-so elements present and ions present in the surrounding. Of course, there are many things that we cannot possibly uh, account for. As a simple example, uh, there was no proof for the H1 region until very recently in 1951-52, we figured out, okay, the H1 region also exists. We thought, we always thought that uh, the, there are hydrogen atoms also present, but their energy was so low that we could not account for it. All right, so simple uh, radio astrophysics could not describe this uh, region. It was much, much later using some advanced instruments that we came to the conclusion that, okay, this H actually exists. All right, so there are still more uh, concepts that we still don't know. That's why we have uh, the research going on in this topic. There, there is something that you all already know called dark matter. What is dark matter? Do you know? Chakadar? Yeah, yeah, that is, uh, I see it uh, constitutes about some 27% of the thing. You know, it so it's, uh, it's basically the matter that we still can't observe, right? That's dark matter. Right. We know that energy is getting released from there, but we can't observe it. Now, it's not magic, meaning uh, we, we cannot assume that, okay, the energy is coming out of nowhere. Energy is stored in matter and that is radiated. Isn't it so? So maybe not today, but let's say after a few years, we'll again come out with some more important and interesting results. One of the projects that I worked on was uh, on gravitational waves. So uh, that's a different story, actually. So there are ways in which we can find out more particles than we already know about. And not today, maybe tomorrow, the topic of uh, energy, the vacuum energy that you're talking about would actually, or uh, would surprisingly be a form of energy enclosed inside a different form of matter. Or it might just be a stored energy, who knows about it. But there, are, there will always be something. Thank you very much. By the way, what application you are using, just used for teaching, it was such a cool application. <laughs> there are actually many applications that I'm using. I'm using one uh, drawing application for writing, another one I'm using for graphing, Desmos application. And uh, there are some images that I've also used. And, uh, you know, likewise. Thank you very much. It was so good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Kanish, you had your hand raised. Uh, do you want to ask something? Kanish, are you there? Oh, sorry, it was by mistake. Ah, okay, fine. Uh, Dwej, I saw your hand raised. Uh, is there something you want to ask? Yeah, so uh, in the star, when you derived the equation of uh, some equation, then Which equation? in the I forgot. Uh, it was related to the integration and uh, it was probably the pressure okay. equation. So in the end, continue, continue. So in the end, uh, the upper limit, you yeah. assumed that the pressure was zero. Yeah. So is that the reason why the sun is losing mass? The, the sun is losing mass and no. it is See, uh, directed the equation... to the cosmic rays. The equation that I had derived from there was uh, nothing but again the virial theorem. 
and the equation that i used for that was the hydrostatic equilibrium equation so what i did i just multiplied another factor 4 pi r cube and then i integrated with respect to position now uh, that's something actually that's a very um, elementary method of deriving it now what happens is that the sun as a whole does not lose mass it loses the usable mass uh, we talk about any star for that matter all right now it's not actually about the star losing mass that we should be worried about it's about the star losing usable energy all right now there is a simple case like you suggested the star uh, well if the sun is losing mass there is no uh, evidence to suggest that but in the nuclear level uh, is the video stopped yeah, there was a little connection problem so okay okay so when the uh, what's that called uh, now so in the nuclear reactions that undergo you will always see that the reactants mass is always a little less than the mass of the product did you understand this which no sir can you please repeat yeah the effective mass for example if i talk about the pp chain itself then the effective mass of the interacting uh, protons the inter the two you can see the equation ones h1 plus h1 you will see the interacting masses and the resultant product which is the deuterium nucleus have a difference in mass now this is something very basic from a nuclear physics when you study any nuclear reaction every nuclear reaction you know approaches stability stability means what going towards higher binding energy values so where does this extra binding energy come from? It comes from decreasing mass and converting a part of this mass into energy. Did you understand? Yes, sir. So you can see this is the reason why the effective mass of the fuel is decreasing and making a more stable structure. Got it? Pressure has nothing to do with it. So is that the Q factor that you're talking about? The Q energy? In your play physics? Very good. Q, yes, correct. Very good. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you, sir. All right. Um, next question we have from Vishesh in the chat box. And he says that um, it is known that galaxies traveling away from us undergo redshift. So the yeah. actual distance between us and the observed galaxy has to be adjusted accordingly. Sir, Definitely. how do we know how much this shift must be adjusted to get the true distance? Okay. That's his question. See. Now, first of all, the, in the equations that you see, we don't talk about any values. In none of the equations that we have used for any formulation, have we actually used any values. Now, the entire system that we're talking about is called dynamics, all right? It's known as classical or you can say general dynamics, in which we introduce time, all right? For example, if we talk about contraction of the, you know, giant, um, uh, it's called molecular cloud, GMC, into a cluster of protostar. Even that uses some time. So to answer your question, if we talk about, let's say, the accurate value of R, all right, to describe the given red shift or the blue shift, there are many factors associated with that. All right, so for example, there is a certain speed. So if, uh, and again, one more thing, by the way, this is not, again, a question of uh, a non-relativistic dynamics. It's a question of relativistic dynamics. Because if you observe, like you said, that the distance between the center and the galaxy is changing. So if the distance is changing, it means there is relative motion. Now, in such a scale, the motion does not uh, you know, come at 10 meters per second or you know, 50 meters per second. It reaches much higher speeds. Got it. So in that case, your classical dynamics to work. We have to, there is no other option, we have to come to some um, relativistic approach for that. All right, so that's a different story. Uh, if, I, if I have some more time, I would have done all that, but then. <laughs> I think okay. we can put that into the notes later on, yeah. if needed. Uh, but it's so something think... very simple. You don't have to worry too much about it. All you have to do is just assume that uh, at any given point of time, the distance can be assumed to be constant. Take time to be zero and take time to be dt. Small time will change in its interval. And you see the relative shift is not that big. 
All right, so for that, uh, you know, very short period of time, you can take out of the Right. Uh, we'll take the last question from Kandori Aditya, uh, who asks, what is the difference between thermonuclear fusion and uh, PY, uh, pike non-nuclear, or, or I, don't, I don't know if I get that, pike no, nu pike no nuclear fusion? Just repeat once again, I could not, I, is your voice breaking or I think my voice is breaking? I mean, I'm not sure. Okay, so uh, it's from the chat box and it's uh, the... Uh, Aditya asks, what is the difference between thermonuclear One, fusion? Vikram, I can't hear you. Just a minute. I'll close my video if that's okay. Okay. Hi. Yeah, sure, sure. No problem. Uh, can you hear me now? Better? Hello. Can you hear me, sir? Yeah. Uh, yes, tell. Yeah, okay. So uh, Aditya asks, what is the difference between thermonuclear fusion and pike no nuclear fusion? Thermonuclear fusion and? Pike no. P-Y-C-N-O nuclear. Wait, wait. Your voice is breaking once again. Just give me a few seconds. Let the uh, network connection become stable. There is this notification when network connection is unstable. You can find the question in the chat box, sir. I'll just probably send it. Yeah, yeah, you can just send the chat on the question on WhatsApp. Uh, yeah, I've dropped the question on WhatsApp. On WhatsApp, you have sent me? Yes, sir, yes. Okay, so the difference between thermonuclear and Acha, pike no nuclear fusion. Okay, okay, all right. I'll just switch on my video. If, uh, I'll just explain it. Sure, sure. Can you see my video now? Yes, sir, your video is visible. Okay, uh, who had asked this? This is uh, Ad, uh, Kanduri Aditya. Kanduri. Okay, Aditya. Um, Aditya, yeah. Yes, Aditya. I think Kanduri Aditya. Yeah. All right. You know about thermonuclear fusion is not something very complicated. Now, here I'll explain spike nuclear fusion. Now, for understanding pike nuclear fusion, we have to go to the uh, quantum mechanical model of particles. Okay. Now, if you condense particles, all right, condensation means what? Condensation means reducing the energy level to the least possible level. All right, you're reducing the energy of the particle to the least value. All right. So what you are doing is you are restricting all the particles. Let's say this is particle one, this is particle two. Now, at this point, it would not matter whether they are fermions or whether they are bosons, we'll assume that uh, the wave functions are overlapping, or at least the waves are overlapping. So what happens here that at such a low energy level, the waves of the two particles are somewhat overlapping, right? So as they overlap, now this is a very pictorial way to understand it. I'm trying to explain it in a very pictorial way. So what happens is that when these two wave functions overlap, is my video clear? Can you all see this properly? Yes, sir. Okay, so when these two wave functions overlap, there is a very simple and very uh, huge possibility, probability of gaining again a nuclear fusion. Can you see this? So one nucleus are approaching other nucleus and they're both overlapping, right? This is known as spike nuclear fusion. Got it? Uh, I don't think Aditya is here, but I'm pretty Aditya, sure. Aditya, the simple yeah, case that happens due to network. overlapping of wave functions. All, All right. right, he says yes, sir. Okay. He says yes. Oh, so uh, Rishikesh has an add-on question. Uh, he asks if this yeah. could also add upon a ryonuclear fusion. No, no. I told you, low energy states, right? The star is all about high energy states, right? Yeah, can, can I get yes. one, one more, please, if you don't mind? Um, do you have yeah, any, ask me. Yeah. Do you have any relation, uh, mathematical relation equating cosmological constant as well as Hubble constant? I saw the net, I couldn't get it. Yes, I think Vikram would like to answer that question because yeah, he wanted to cover the topic of cosmology. So You can tell it now, sir. Will do that uh, I, I wouldn't attempt it right now. Uh, please repeat your question. Uh, do you have any relation 
uh, equate, I mean, reading a cosmological constant as well as a Hubble constant. Because both of them relate to the same thing. One is time invariant, another There is are, there are time dependent. There are many methods here. There is not, a, it's not a big question also. There are many equations that you can use to relate both of these constants. All right. Uh, first model is time dependent. The second model is time independent. That's all. All right. It's it's basically uh, like a question of how can you relate a time dependent wave function to time independent wave function. It's not something complicated. All right. I think uh, when you start cosmology, just before you reach the general theory, you will uh, be covering all this. I think Vidyant will also be covering all this. Yeah, I will be touching there are this ways. later on. Thank you. Thank you, Chakrata sir. Okay, uh, so we will uh, stop the questions session here. Uh, Alan sir, thank you very much on behalf of Nakshatra and all of the members of Equinox. It was a great talk. Yeah. And uh, through yeah. the comment section, I could see that everyone enjoyed it thoroughly. Uh, I think they'll be waiting yeah. for your notes as well, you know, because and everyone asked this to be recorded because it was extremely useful for all of us and personally this was a very good revision for me the class okay yes i have some notes but the problem uh, your voice is breaking so yeah i said the, i have the notes but the, the thing is that uh what is called uh, the handwriting will be in so <laughs> like we discussed before Right. Yeah, uh, you can just send them over to me and I will uh, tweak them around. I'll, you know, yeah. rectify it, make it a little neater. And I'll there, there were actually a little more topics that I wanted to cover, but because of this time restriction, I think yeah. all that I'll, I'll you can put that in the notes and yeah. uh, we'll be sure to pass it on. So on behalf of Nakshatra and the members of Equinox, I'd like to thank you very much. Okay. This is okay. very informative and uh, I hope I can pass on questions to you if there's any more asked yeah. in our uh, groups later on. Okay. Okay. We want you to be a part of Equinox until the end, so we might invite you again for a few more lectures. Yeah, sure. sure. Thanks a lot, sir. Uh, okay. And uh, we'll end this session here. Jivan? All right. Okay. okay. Good night. Good night. Good night, sir. Good night. Have a good call. So I'll leave now? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, Jivan will end the call.